What's good? It's Wood. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. We have Ryan Garcia, 21 wins and zero losses, taking on Emmanuel Tego, 32 wins and one loss. This is the long-awaited return of Ryan Garcia, who after his biggest win, basically the biggest step-up opponent in his career, which resulted in a knockout for Ryan Garcia in the seventh round, was followed by an unexpected hiatus, which has now lasted about 15 months or so. Ryan Garcia is the very, very popular and super heavy-handed, one of the most devastating punchers, dangerous punchers in the sport. And he's one of those rare cases where the fame kind of outpaced the accomplishments and accolades to where you're trying to then catch up with the accomplishments to then merit all of the hype. And in beating Luke Campbell, that's basically what Ryan Garcia did. But since that fight, he has actually parted ways with his trainer, one of the best trainers in the sport, Canelo Alvarez's esteemed trainer, Eddie Reynoso and has now joined forces with longtime veteran trainer Joe Goosen, one of the more respected trainers of the past few decades. Now, the reason for the hiatus was linked to a couple of things. First, it was a, a mental health issue where Ryan Garcia basically said he needed to, to kind of sort things out in his head, in his life, before he gets back full-time into boxing, and then it was followed by a hand injury, which, you know, between the mental health issues and the injury, he pulled out of fights uh, against uh, Joseph Jojo Diaz, uh, Javier Fortuna, and just after beating Luke Campbell in his latest fight, the biggest step-up fight, which made him the mandatory challenger for Devin Haney's WBC belt, he declined to fight with Devin Haney and was instead trying to pursue bigger opportunities. He wanted to fight Gervonta Tank Davis. He wanted to fight Manny Pacquiao. Neither of those things panned out, and then he went on the hiatus. And so here he is about to take on Emmanuel Tego. And so instead of basically jumping right back into the fire and trying to take on like a top five top eight type of lightweight this is kind of seen as a not quite a tune-up fight but relatively speaking like if you're trying to compare Emmanuel Tego to like a Tank Davis a Devin Haney Teofimo Lopez anybody of that caliber so Ryan Garcia, most of us know the story. He basically basically became a social media sensation, putting a bunch of videos up there when he was a very, very young professional. And even before that, when he was still an amateur, just kind of uh, showcasing his blazing hand speed, which is also coupled with devastating power. And so he basically became a Instagram sensation as he was kind of working up the ranks, fighting the likes of uh, Jason Velez and uh, Carlos Morales. Carlos Morales. I remember being a pretty difficult fight and to the point where basically the big time A-side fighter Ryan Garcia was getting booed by the crowd because everybody had heard about his devastating knockout power, how much he was like a like a must-see TV type of fighter and then he basically struggled with, you know, lesser known Carlos Morales. He ended up winning a, a majority decision. This is back in uh, September of 2018. And then his next fights after that were against Braulio Rodriguez, Jose Lopez, and Romero Duno. Uh, and he knocked them out in the fifth round, the second round, and the first round, respectively. So that was starting to pretty much add to the hype. And he was basically fighting on, this is when DAZN was just linking with Golden Boy. And, you know, it seemed like Tevin Farmer, for instance, was fighting on so many fight cards at the time. But Golden Boy, promoter of Ryan Garcia, was starting to position him on a lot of good undercards. And then he basically had a Valentine's Day fight against Francisco Fonseca. And Francisco Fonseca has fought some elite fighters in the past. Pretty much a bigger name than we were used to seeing Ryan Garcia fight in his young career. And then he knocks Francisco Fonseca out in the first round. This was a devastating knockout. Very surprising. And so this basically catapulted his name even more like, damn, this kid is looking for real. And then he fought... Luke Campbell about a year later and this is the fight where Ryan Garcia gets dropped 
in the second round of the fight. He basically, you know, Luke Campbell was a southpaw, was basically a former title contender. He had fought uh, Vasily Lomachenko super competitively, fought uh, Jorge Linares very competitively. So he was basically, if not elite, just a tier below the tops. And so Ryan Garcia, again, got dropped in the second round where Luke Campbell went low, or at least looked low, and then threw a sweeping, looping right hand, or I'm sorry, left hand high, basically caught Ryan Garcia flush on the chin. Ryan Garcia falls back and basically falls like on his arm with his arm tucked under him. But he got up, finished the round strong, seemed to have his wherewithal, makes it out of the round, and then basically wins the next round, wins the third round, and he ends up knocking Luke Campbell out in the seventh round after hurting Luke Campbell like in the fifth round to where he catches him cleanly with a beautiful check hook. And then Luke Campbell kind of stumbles into the ropes and the ropes basically catch him. But, but that was the end of the round. And then two rounds later, Ryan Garcia finishes Luke Campbell with a body shot. Beautiful body shot. And again, that is Ryan Garcia's last fight. And so now he's about to fight Emmanuel Tago, who is a... I want to say he's a regional sensation. Like we see a lot of these fighters in different parts of the world where they're fighting mostly in their home country. In this case, Emmanuel Tego, he's from Ghana. Ghana has produced some very good and great boxers in the past. Azuma Nelson is probably the greatest fighter to come out of uh, Ghana. After that, maybe uh, Ike Quarte. Uh, more recently, we've seen uh, Richard Comey and Isaac Dogbe have some, you know, elite and near elite level success. Isaac Dogbe, you know, won his title against um, Magdaleno and then lost it against Emmanuel Navarrete, who's still holding that featherweight title. I think he's probably the best featherweight in the sport right now, Navarrete. But yeah, we've seen some very good fighters from Ghana. Uh, Joshua Clotty is another one. Uh, David Cote is more of a historic one. Uh, Joseph Agbeko is another one who we've recently seen in action. Uh, several years ago, Floyd Robertson's another one. So yeah, Ghana has produced some very good fighters. And Emmanuel Tego appears to be the other one who's basically, you know, scratching at the surface of greatness here. Again, his record is 32-1. and one. His one loss came super early in his career. In fact, it was his very first professional fight. So basically he's won every fight since. He's 32 and 0 in his last 32 fights. And you know, I, his footage is somewhat difficult to find, but I've watched enough of his fights to kind of see what we're dealing with here. He is a he's actually a pretty good defensive fighter. He's got better reflexes, at least better reflexes than most of the opponents that he's been fighting. If you go back and you find a fight between him and George Ashey, and I wanted to like go back and find a fight where he fights a taller fighter who looks like he's throwing really hard because Emmanuel Tego in his last few fights has been fighting fighters more or less about his same height. Well, when he steps in against Ryan Garcia, Garcia is going to have like a two inch height advantage. Uh, he's going to have the reach advantage. So Emmanuel uh, Tego, he's pretty much somebody who's able to like slip a lot of punches. He's got pretty good head movement, but he kind of fights sort of low where he's in a, uh, where he's in a lower crouch and he's basically, you know, out jabbing his opponents and he usually has faster hands than his opponents. It wasn't the case when he fought this guy, uh, George Ashey, like 12 or so fights ago. G George Ashey, by the way, gave Emmanuel uh, Tago a run for his money. Probably the closest fight Tago has had since he lost that first fight of his career. Go try to find Emmanuel Tago versus George Ashey. Ashey's basically swinging for the fence. And it's anybody's guess, you know, who should have actually won that fight. Emmanuel Tego won a majority decision there, but it was a very tough fight. He was getting tagged by some of uh, Ashy's right hands. And by the way, I might be butchering the last name. It could be Ashe, right hands. But yeah, very difficult fight for Emmanuel Tego. But if you look at his last few fights against like Mason Menard, which I mean, that was actually a tough one too. That was his only fight since the COVID pandemic. This one took place in November 2020. He won a majority decision over Mason Menard, who's also fought some uh, high level opponents. But like before that, uh, he fought Ishmael Arete. And then a few fights prior to that fought David Salcedo. When he fought Salcedo, it was clear from the opening 
opening bell who the more talented fighter was. It was actually kind of surprising that it took Tego about 10 years to get David Salcedo, who really didn't bring a lot of elite skills to the table. Yes, he was tough and durable, but he, you know, he wasn't moving his head a lot. He wasn't really bringing the pain in terms of throwing like a lot of like volume or very fast punches or devastatingly hard punches. He should have gotten rid of Salcedo earlier, but it took him 10 rounds. This was a 12 rounder, but he eventually got him out of there. Uh, when he fought Ishmael uh, Arite, he finished him after the sixth round. Basically, Arite quit in the corner. But when I'm seeing Tego fight these guys, with the exception of Ashe, Tego's clearly like the more talented fighter. He usually has the faster hands. He's throwing more volume. He's got the better head movement and body movement. So it looks like he's able to get comfortable enough to where he's kind of dropping his hands, kind of doing all that slick stuff. And then he's going in, throwing some nice combinations, mixing up the attack uh, between the head and the body, and eventually, in a lot of cases, getting them out. Now, he only has about like a 50% knockout ratio, maybe slightly higher than that. But as I'm analyzing... Ryan Garcia versus Emmanuel Tego. I'm just thinking if Tego isn't the type who could, you know, get you out of there with like one punch or something, and he's got to go ser several rounds with Ryan Garcia, who doesn't have great head movement, so he is kind of there to get hit, somewhat stationary, and he doesn't move his feet a ton. He's a little bit like flat-footed, where he's basically taking just one step at a time. Like, if you look at early Oscar De La Hoya, look at how De La Hoya, when he was fighting at like lightweight or even before that, look at how De La Hoya moves his feet. He's basically moving in and out of the pocket, moving around the ring, in and out with great footwork. Ryan Garcia possesses very little of that. So again, he's kind of standing tall with his chin there. He's not moving his feet a ton, so basically he's daring you to jump in and he's looking to counter you with something that's a showstopper, which in all but three of his fights has been the case. All but three of his fights have resulted in knockout. So if Emmanuel T Tego isn't able to basically make Ryan Garcia really pay for keeping his chin high, which Tego does have some power, but he's going to have to keep on jumping in the pocket to make up for the height and reach disparity. So he's not going to be able to just sit there in like long range boxing range, right? So he's either got to be totally out of the pocket or he's got to jump in the pocket where he's close enough to hit Ryan Garcia. But if he's doing that, Ryan Garcia is really good at taking that one step back and throwing that check hook. I just see all types of red flags there for Emmanuel Otego. Like, Ryan Garcia has an underrated left hand, or I'm sorry, right hand as well. He'll throw that straight right, and he just throws everything so fast and so hard. Like, it's almost like his arms and his shoulders are, are built in a way where he's able to let like two, three punch combinations go just in a different way then most fighters are able to let them go. Like his punch deployment mechanism looks like he's almost dealing with different joint structure where he's able to just like dislodge with this lightning quick left hook and a straight right. And he'll throw it like a boom, boom, throw a one, two with authority. So again, if you're Emmanuel Tego, how do you navigate these waters? Well, he's not tall enough where he's about the same height as Ryan Garcia like Luke Campbell was. So Luke's, Luke Campbell could basically win a jab battle, you know, because he was left-handed. So Ryan Garcia had to respect the left hand. Here, all I see is Ryan Garcia staring down a significantly shorter, by significantly I mean like two inches or more, shorter opponent who doesn't stand tall himself. So Emmanuel Tego stands lower than he is tall. So Ryan Garcia has a tall stance. Emmanuel Tego has a cr more of a crouching stance. And again, he's going to have to jump in and out of the pocket. So even if he's able to survive the first couple rounds, if this goes into the middle rounds, I don't see this getting any less dangerous for Emmanuel Tego at 33 years old. And Ryan Garcia, for the concerns that we might have about him, you know, the flat feet, the lack of head movement, uh, changing trainers, and this being his first fight under the tutelage of Joe Goosen, which, by the way, people are talking about, like, what is, what's the reason? Is it because of the beef? Is it because Canelo said what he said? Ryan Garcia has be, said it's because Eddie Reynoso can't give him, you know, all of his attention and efforts. Is there anything to be said about the fact that Eddie, that Eddie Reynoso speaks 
only Spanish and doesn't speak English. Ryan Garcia only speaks English, doesn't speak Spanish. So Ryan Garcia's dad had to do the translating. I think that that fact is being underlooked in terms of what might be ideal. Not to say that they it didn't work because they were obviously able to do some very good things. But you would think that the communication path is a lot more seamless between Joe Goose and Ryan Garcia just because of the language barrier. You know, I think I feel like that part is being under discussed and all that. But yeah, this is Garcia's first fight under the tutelage of Joe Goose. And so there might be that concern as well. I just feel like his physical, natural gifts in this case will be enough to get by Emmanuel Tego. So even if Ryan Garcia has some early trouble where he's got to kind of catch up to the speed of Emmanuel Tego's like combination punching, how active a fighter Tego is, because Tego likes to do a lot. He's moving a lot and he's throwing a lot and he's jabbing, jabbing. But I think that his output is going to be muted because Tego is going to have to respect the power and speed of Ryan Garcia. So I don't think Tego is going to be letting his hands go like we see him letting his hands go in these other fights against Menard, against Arite, against Salcedo, Moses and so forth. I think we're going to see a slightly more reluctant or tepid Emmanuel Tego because if we don't, I think this is going to be a short night. So he's going to have to be a little bit more uh, calculated in terms of when he's coming in and when he's exchanging. I just feel like it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when Garcia catches him hard coming in or if he doesn't catch him coming in and Tego lets his hands go, when Tego tries to jump back out, Garcia takes a step forward and lets a you know right hand followed by a left hook go or something like that. Because he'll pick his spots and like just let his hands go with four, five, six punch combinations to Garcia. So sometimes he'll play the cautious counter puncher like I'm going to wait for you to jump in and then boom, hit you with the check hook. Other times you'll say, you know what, screw this. And he'll actually come forward and let four mean punches go and dare you to exchange with him. I just see too many ways of Ryan Garcia potentially hurting Emmanuel Tego to where it's very difficult for me to find a true path to victory for Tego. So I'm going Ryan Garcia not only to win, but to win via knockout. I think it's going to occur probably in the middle to late rounds here. I wouldn't be totally surprised if Garcia finishes him early, but I think that Tego's going to have enough heart to get out of early trouble and bring this fight into the middle rounds i just think that at some point he's gonna get you know shaky legged a little too badly to where either the either the ref jumps in and saves him or he gets knocked down repeatedly to where the ref either waves it off or he gets knocked out to where he can't where he can't beat a 10 count or his corner throws in a towel something like that but i think it's more likely to occur in the middle and or late rounds than it is in the early rounds but yeah, I don't see Tego winning more than, say, like two rounds here before he gets stopped. Maybe even less than that. Again, he's going to have to pay a toll to jump in on Ryan Garcia. And unless he's able to invest to the body early and then explode high and just totally catch Ryan Garcia slipping, it's going to be a tough fight to win. Because again, he's a combination puncher. Yes, he is pretty good defensively, but... I mean, Ryan Garcia's hand speed, like how many of those can you really slip before you get buzzed badly? So yeah, I'm going Ryan Garcia via stoppage here. But yeah, let me know what you think in the comments. If Garcia does make it past Emmanuel Tego, where do you think he goes from here now that it appears that we're going to get George Cambosos versus Devin Haney for all the belts? Should Ryan Garcia make a cross-promotional effort to fight Gervonta Tank Davis? Uh, should he fight somebody else within the DAZN banner? Maybe a fight against uh, Tevin Farmer if and when Tevin Farmer gets back in the ring and you know further establishes himself in a return fight because he hasn't fought since he lost his IBF 130-pound title to Joseph Jojo Diaz. So yeah, where do you see Ryan Garcia going from here? Please let me know what you think in the comments. And by the way, how much longer do you think Ryan Garcia could fight at 135? Because I see him as being a pretty big lightweight. And as he enters his mid-20s, because these are most of these guys are very young. Him, Devin Haney, these are big, young lightweights. How many more fights do you see Ryan Garcia fighting a lightweight before he goes up to 140? Yeah, let me know what you think. Please like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. I'm Wook. Thanks for tuning in.